And uh, yeah, Sam is going to now interpret that and then you can jump into the other room. Thank you. Sí, hola a todos. Gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Mi nombre es Rachel Roberts. Soy la líder de participación con la comunidad. Ahora, si alguien quisiera escuchar la interpretación, haga el favor de conectarse en una tableta o computadora. Pulse el icono de Global para en la parte inferior de su pantalla para y seleccione el idioma de español. Thanks, Sam. Okay, I'll switch you over now. Okay. If you did not switch over to the Spanish channel, you should still be hearing this in English, but if you have any um, technical difficulties, you can message Emma uh, in the chat. So speaking of the chat, um, if you were at the last uh, Shared Streets community uh, meeting, then you probably have used some of these uh, things before. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A function, which this red arrow is pointing to. Um, throughout the presentation, if you have questions that you would like an answer to, go ahead and pop that in the question and answer section. Um, and then if you have any like things that you just wanna make a comment um, on, then you can pop that in the chat and we'll note that stuff down as well. And then of course, please be kind and respectful and um, share your thoughts kindly as well. Great. Um, so we have a bunch to go through today, but know that at the end, we will have a lot of time for the question and answer. Um, so first we'll do introductions of the project team, uh, then we'll talk about the temporary shared streets, um, and then we'll really dive into the shared streets program that we're building um, that will be a formal program within DOTI. And then we'll talk about the locational analysis survey uh, that we have gotten, I think, over 700 responses for so far. So we'll dive into that as well, and then uh, do some next steps and, like I said, have time for that Q&A. So I'll hand it off to Jay for introductions. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, and thanks for being able to join us for our second uh, Shared Street Community meeting. Looking forward to chatting with you. My name is Jay Decker. I manage our Office of Innovation, uh, and I am the project manager on the Dottie side for building this program. Great, um, Emma. Hi, everyone, I'm Emma. I am working with Consor and Dottie on this project, and I'll am leading some of the locational analysis. Great, and Dean. Hi, everybody, I'm Dean Wynn Stanley. I work with uh, NHN Consulting, and I'm uh, helping to provide the, organize the public engagement for the Shared Street Project. Charlie. Hey, good evening, Charlie Alexander, supporting the team uh, in developing design guidelines for Shared Streets in Denver. Thanks everyone. And a couple of our team members are at the District 11 Town Hall right now doing some additional outreach for this project. So um, we're missing them tonight, but they're doing some great work. So um, next I wanted to do a Zoom poll um, asking what part of the city you live in. So I will launch that now. And you should now see on your screen uh, the poll with a bunch of different questions or answers on it. And once I close this, we can all see the results. Great. The front runner right now looks like it's uh, central Denver with uh, south Denver in a close second. Wait for a couple more people to answer. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. Cool. You should see on the screen the results of who we have represented here tonight. So pretty good spread across the, the um, city. Cool. Um, okay, now we're going to jump into the Temporary Shared Streets Initiative. So, Jay, I'll hand it off to you. Wonderful. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you for a little bit. First off, talking about the Temporary Shared Streets. Uh, for those that uh, have been participating in this so far, this may be a little bit of a recap, but for those that uh, this is the first time, we're going to um, you know, educate you a little bit just so we all have a shared background. Um, so, you know, transporting ourselves back to uh, April 2020, uh, we noticed as a city that um, during the stay at home order, um, quite a lot of our residents were actually outside 
Uh, we live in the great state of Colorado. We love to be outside. Um, it doesn't matter if the governor tells us to stay inside, we are not going to stay inside 100%. And so what we started to see was uh, quite a lot of people were um, running, um, you know, just kind of hanging out, uh, pushing strollers in the streets so they could actually have proper distance from folks during the pandemic. And then also some of our uh, most popular parks were being just frankly, overcrowded um, with just the amount of people that wanted to be outside. Uh, so as a city, we moved to uh, locate um, what we ended up having 11 different corridors, uh, approximately seven different miles of what we call shared streets. They rolled out over the course of that summer uh, and they were out there for uh, until 2021 uh, that summer. And really what you're looking at here is an image of you know, one of the early shared streets that we put out. And so these, uh, you know, were done very quickly um, using construction materials. And so they very much were uh, intended to be temporary. Um, I think we had intended for them to be out there for about a month uh, when we naively didn't understand what a pandemic was. Uh, and of course they were able to stay out much longer thanks to the overwhelming support um, from residents, uh, your elected officials and the mayor as well who asked us to keep them out there. Um, so we were actually able to, uh, next slide please, Rachel, um, actually able to iterate on them while um, we had them out there. Um, so we had a lot of, you know, unique issues uh, in Colorado we had to deal with. They had to make it through, you know, what we would call in Dottie the snow season. So plowing and, and ice build up and things like that. Uh, and then also uh, a lot of those early barricades, uh, they caused a bit of a, a maintenance issue. They were really easy to move. So the wind would move them. Uh, people that wanted to um, drive down these streets would move them. Folks that would want shared streets in front of their house would move them in front of their house. And so it just actually created uh, a lot of issues keeping these in place. And so what we were able to try out is uh, leaning into, you know, building more neighborhood bikeway type materials, uh, paint and flex post, curb extensions, and then also some more um, what we would call kind of hardened um, temporary material. So using water-filled barricades. And so very temporary, uh, but very heavy when you have them filled with water. So folks weren't able to move them as easily. Uh, and we were able to play around with some designs uh, and iterate some of the locations as well. So it was a learning experience for the city. Uh, and uh, we're, we're glad that we were able to kind of build that um, as we got feedback from the community. And uh, to, to make, a, maybe I'm dating myself here, but to make a kind of a bad pun about a, a movie, you know, if you build it, they will come. I think that really shows in Denver um, with how many people love to be outside and be active is that, you know, shared streets, um, they are shared. Um, so we couldn't physically close the street down to all cars because these were in front of folks' houses. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we greatly reduce the number of vehicles on those streets. So only the cars that needed to be on those streets were allowed. Uh, and then the cars that were on those streets, we wanted to make sure that they were going uh, much lower than normal. Uh, and as a result, that really just created a really high comfort environment where folks felt comfortable walking uh, and biking and yoga in and all the things on these shared streets. Uh, it was really exciting to see just the overwhelming support and magnitude that people flock to these um, safe and comfortable spaces when we got uh, a lot of cars and slowed down the remaining cars there. People felt comfortable um, to have a people first space to recreate. And then as uh, a part of this program, um, you know, we decided to look back and actually, uh, you know, gather community feedback, many of you which probably responded to this. Uh, early on is um, we actually got over 3,000 responses and really it was kind of asking folks, you know, how, you know, what did you like about the shared streets? How can they be improved? Uh, what were some of your favorites? Just so we kind of had that touch point, um, you know, a year or so removed from having the temporary shared streets, uh, what folks still thought of them after the fact. And what we found out is that, uh, you know, really overwhelmingly people really liked them um, when they were up. And a majority of folks would actually like to see them come back in a permanent fashion, either on the streets that they were on or in completely different parts of the city. Uh, and one really important uh, note about this survey I want to mention 
is that um, you know a lot of times we we survey the folks. Um, it's not always super representative. It kind of really depends on who sees the survey uh, and who has the time to participate. Uh, but most importantly, on this survey, uh, over half of the respondents, over 1,500 people, actually physically lived on a shared street or were immediately adjacent to it. So these are the folks that actually got to see it on a daily basis, uh, both good and bad. And still those folks overwhelmingly supported these and wanted them to come back. So I think that really shows that it's not necessarily just advocates or people that um, are moving through these neighborhoods, you know, on their commute or for recreating. The people that lived out in front of them really loved them, and they really appreciated having a slower, safer street by their house. So now we get into, you know, the work that we've been um, doing the last uh, eight-ish months on actually building the shared street program. So that formal program, after we were able to experiment uh, and found it to be a huge success, we wanted to continue that momentum, uh, but take the time to actually build it right. Because like I said, we we kind of planned and designed it uh, very quickly during the pandemic. So you might be saying, you know, why spend time to build the program? You know, it, it was out there for, you know, over a year. It worked really well. Why can't we do more of that? Well, outside of what we talked about, the temporary nature, the temporary materials and things like that, um, we did this during the height of the pandemic, and we did it quickly to meet a need. And so what we want to do with building this program is to, to actually take our time and to do it thoughtfully. And so we set ourselves up for success for the many decades in Denver moving forward where we can start to build more of these shared streets and enjoy them and change kind of some of the outlook uh, of our streets in Denver. And so we really want to start with building that program with community input, which is a uh, a really important key component of here, and we already talked about it a little bit, and it's exactly why we're here today to work with you. We then also want to identify locations where some of these future shared streets could go. Um, certainly, we are looking in depth at some of the temporary locations, but we want to make sure that we look citywide um, so we didn't overlook any potential locations uh, when we are quickly implementing the temporary version. Uh, and then other things that the city needs to do to figure out internally how to set ourselves up for success. Um, so building design guidelines, um, working with the community to figure out how these should look and feel, how are they maintained, um, you know, green infrastructure elements, um, you know, how, how uh, many safety precautions should we have? Um, are they, you know, something that's a little bit more close to um, pavers and something really nice versus being able to do something a little bit more quickly and kind of what that looks and feels like. And then we need a whole lot of internal organization at the city. You know, what are our resources? How many people need to be hired? How do we manage these? Uh, and then uh, the last uh, component here really is just, you know, that long-term roadmap. The, the city traditionally looks at a six-year capital program. Um, so we want to set goals, understand feasibly kind of what the budget that we can allocate for this, uh, and then figure out what ultimately we would like to construct every year for the next six years and then beyond um, for us to be successful with this. Uh, and so that kind of gets us into a little bit more specifics about what we want to talk with you today and then some of the work that we've been doing in the last few months. And so uh, a big part of it is going to be a recap on community engagement and then to get additional feedback from you today. Uh, and then, But then we'll also go into details around developing that program, um, how we're looking at some of the analysis as far as where some of these shared streets could go, um, where we've made progress on how these are going to look and feel, and then ultimately um, paving the way for us to actually start constructing these in the future. Uh, but before we kind of get into that, just a quick note that uh, through the Denver Moves Everyone planning process that's been going on for, uh, I think, a little over two years and just actually released the first public draft, uh, we really want to show that you know, a lot of those conversations that we had at the citywide level are fully baked into this program. Um, so the city does uh, officially consider uh, different modes of travel to be a higher priority, depending on the different corridors uh, and the vulnerability of those users. And then also making sure that um, a lot of the goals, um, and really the vision for Dottie uh, and the city of Denver to have such important components like sustainability, equity, 
um, safety, in addition to kind of the community and mobility things that we do, that actually is persuasive through this whole development of this program. And so uh, with all of that considered, uh, where we've landed as far as the program vision goes, uh, so this is kind of our guiding star throughout this process and will be uh, into the future when we start constructing these, is that we want our shared street program to first and foremost prioritize people uh, through the creation of those comfortable spaces where those people can move, interact, and play within the right of way. Um, and then it's really important because these are very unique kinds of streets um, that we are also able to successfully maintain and sustain this program as well. Uh, so it is uh, truly built for success from the start. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Um, and just a reminder, uh, if you can see the question and answer tab, you can upvote people's questions if you uh, want us to answer those uh, at the end as well. So now I'm going to launch another Zoom poll. Uh, and this one's kind of a quiz instead of a answer your personal preference. Uh, do you know what percentage of Denver's land area is the right of way, not including the area that's in the airport? Such a good question. I'm really curious to see what the results are on this one because it was quite surprising when we learned this. A lot of people are pretty close. I'll wait a couple more minutes to end the poll. Oh, if you're not seeing the poll, the poll should pop up on your screen. Um, if you can't see any of the pop-up windows though, they might be hidden on another uh, monitor if you have multiple. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. Um, the front runner answer of 40% was correct. It's nearly 40% of the city. It's crazy. Um, so this is just an important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about, you know, transforming uh, areas of the city and the street. We have like a lot of um, literal real estate that we can work with here. So good job, everyone. Okay, moving on. Um, so I just wanted to talk about some of the different tasks uh, with this project that Jay outlined. The first one being community engagement. So there are probably a handful of you that went to the first community meeting uh, that we had back in October of last year. Uh, we had 142 attendees that asked a bunch of questions, um, and it looks like we're already at a good pace to hit that or maybe exceed it too for today. Uh, and as well as uh, it is today, it was available in English and Spanish. And if you weren't able to uh, make that meeting, you can watch those recordings that are live on the website. Um, and just so you know, the recordings from today will also be available on the website in the next few days. Um, we also had a survey uh, recently that we promoted via email, uh, social media. We did some pop-ups around the city, and then Denbright also picked it up and shared it um, in one of their articles as well. So that was pretty neat. Uh, and we had um, almost 1,500 responses, uh, and those questions were really focused on design elements and what people want to see in shared streets. So just to do a few key takeaways of that survey. Um, overall, respondents wanted to see places uh, to socialize and travel through. Uh, so you, as you can see in this photo, um, people are doing both of those things. Uh, this is definitely a more commercial area, um, but people are hanging out, they're moving through, uh, and it's just like a really lively place um, with not a lot of vehicles in it. Uh, the next uh, top key takeaway that we heard was that uh, respondents really want to see more trees and vegetation on shared streets. Uh, and these are elements that would really make people, you know, linger in the street and socialize and hang out um, and make the street uh, a good place to be. And then not surprisingly, safety was also a major theme. Um, people really want to see the reduction of the speed and volume of cars uh, and have a lot more space to just recreate and bike or walk um, in a safer space. So I'm sure you're wondering what a permanent uh, shared street would look like. Uh, if you were at the last meeting or if you followed any of our stuff so far, you probably know that we are looking at two types of shared streets. Um, so a community shared street, which I'll talk about first, is in a residential area. Um, and then commercial shared streets are in commercial areas with a lot of business activity um, and density and things like that. So 
As far as community shared streets, we have two examples here from uh, Boulder and Santa Monica, but you can see that they're, they're more in uh, areas with more housing. Um, you have some amenities on the sides, um, but the key thing that we want to do in Denver is have them be connected to the larger multimodal network. So we're looking at one to three block segments that will be built out um, that connect to other modes. And as far as residential shared streets, these will more so be places for people to travel through and feel safe. Um, and then also if they want to recreate there too, they can. As far as commercial shared streets, um, these are probably, if you've experienced a shared street before, it's probably been a commercial shared street. Uh, they're a lot more common, especially in North America. Um, so on the left here, you can see an example from Asheville. And on the right, you can see an example from Cleveland. Um, but you can tell like the building and the land use type is a lot more focused on business and retail and dining. Um, but again, you see people moving uh, slowly. Um, ideally, we have these connected to the multimodal network. Um, and there are those one to three block segments that we focus on. Um, and then as far as the community engagement that we're doing right now, obviously you are a part of uh, this community meeting. So um, here you're learning about uh, what we're doing with the project and what we plan to do going forward. Uh, and then also I'll talk about this a lot more later, but we are doing a mapping survey um, asking where are good locations for shared streets um, to be in the future. So uh, like I said, I'll talk a lot more about that, but um, we've had the survey open for a decent amount of time and it'll close in a couple weeks. So I have one more poll for you. Uh, this question is, how did your walking and biking habits change during or after the, after the pandemic? So more the same amount or less. I see a lot of more coming in, which is awesome. Cool. Going to end the poll now. Yeah, so as you can see, over 50% of people said that they walked or biked more. 35% um, said about the same and 8% uh, less. Awesome. Okay, that's the last poll. Thank you guys for participating in those. Um, now I'm going to hand it to Charlie for design guidelines. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so as Jay mentioned, figuring out how Denver uh, uh, plans to design shared streets is a big part of this effort. Um, I'm going to hit that at a high level uh, as we've got a lot of content to go through uh, on the locational analysis this evening. Um, but at the highest level, we are trying to connect the design guidelines to the analysis of potential locations for shared streets to understand things like how shared street designs should uh, change according to the functional classification uh, of a street or of a street that connects to a shared street or, or recognizing that the gateways to shared streets are really important. Um, so, uh, you know, shared streets that begin or terminate on a really busy street are something that we really need to think about in, in how we design them. Um, traffic signals sort of follow that, that same um, matter, which is that if a shared street uh, terminates at a signal uh, at, a, at a busier street, then we need to think very specifically about how the gateway to that shared street is designed uh, to make it uh, comfortable for people within the street um, and, and also make sure that people can get onto and off of uh, uh, the street, the, the major street that it connects to. Um, accessibility for people with disabilities uh, is a really important thing in shared street design. Um, so as we're thinking about both uh, 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 quick build and more permanent, you know, overhaul uh, design solutions for our shared streets. We are trying to think about, uh, make, make sure that they're all ADA accessible and think about how different streets in Denver um, are either going to cost more or cost less to achieve that level of accessibility. Um, some of the questions we're thinking, I mentioned uh, uh, elements of the gateways to shared streets. How do we convey to users that they're leaving um, you know, the, the portion of the, the street system that is delineated or separated uh, for different users and entering the shared street environment. Things like raised crossings, things like speed cushions, where we don't have you know, a complete rebuild of the street are things that we're exploring. 
Um, we're trying to get more into the materiality of the treatments that we're using in the street, both for things that we're using to manage the traffic volume and the traffic speed, as well as different amenities that, that would go within the shared streets themselves, and trying to really consider um, how we will design treatments both in those, um, you know, uh, permanent retrofit sorts of um, situations versus the more quick build and, and low cost situations. Um, not a particularly exciting topic for a public meeting, but one that's really important to us is, is how we sign these spaces. Uh, shared streets themselves aren't supposed to have a lot of traffic signage in them. It sort of goes against the idea of, of a shared space. Um, but we do think it's uh, necessary and important that we convey the regulations of how people move within that space, um, and, and particularly the idea of, of people driving needle, needing to yield to people uh, walking and biking within those spaces with signage at their gateways. Um, lastly, um, this this third major bullet, um, how different elements in the space are who actually owns them, who actually maintains them. Um, there's structure for, for all of that currently in Denver uh, in terms of what the Department of Transportation Infrastructure can and cannot do and what other city departments can and cannot do. Um, so as we're building out the program and, and developing design guidelines, we're putting a lot of work into identifying the current state of how things can be maintained uh, in the city of Denver and then uh, future changes that, that will need to happen uh, and, and aligning the design guidelines accordingly. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, now I'm gonna jump into the meat of what we wanna talk about today. Um, this is the locational analysis section that we've referred to a couple of times. Um, you must be wondering, and I've seen some questions in the question and answer, how we will figure out where to put shared streets. Um, if you're familiar with GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems, um, we have that software that we're using to put a bunch of data together and prioritize. Um, but obviously there are a lot of different streets and blocks around the city of Denver. So um, a component of that is gonna be your input that will help prioritize the streets as well. So we're doing the um, locational analysis in two major steps. Um, the first one being identifying candidate streets uh, and I'll dive into how we got here more, but basically we are figuring out what streets can or cannot ever be a shared street. So. Uh, with a few different criteria. There are some that just do not make sense to make a safe or um, functional or successful shared street. So basically that's, you know, weeding out the, the segments that cannot be a shared street. Um, I will say that if, you know, there is a block that you think would actually be a shared street and maybe it didn't hit one of those criteria um, and a lot of people, you know, agreed with you, then we'll consider pulling it back in. So know that your input is very useful there. And then the second major step is the prioritization. So you'll see on the map that I'm going to show you that there are a lot of streets that still hit those um, qualifications and those criteria that we need, uh, and we have to prioritize them somehow. So we're looking at uh, six different categories of criteria that we'll wait and um, come up with, you know, a top X number of shared streets that we plan to implement. Okay, so as far as the candidate streets, so again, this is taking out any streets that absolutely do not make sense. Uh, starting with the community streets, uh, we want those to only be local streets, uh, again, because those are more residential streets. Um, ideally, they're not crossing arterials or signalized intersections because we don't want cars, you know, that are going at a faster speed turning onto these streets, therefore making it an unsafe environment. Um, we don't want it to be in an RTD bus route uh, because we don't want to cause transit delays. Um, and the infrastructure that we're thinking of doesn't mesh too well with um, keeping buses on schedule and reliable, which is also something that's very important. Um, but it does tie into uh, having the multimodal network that um, a prioritization criteria is also how connected it is to other um, multimodal functions. So keep that in mind there. Um, and then it also doesn't really make sense to have a community shared street on um, adjacent to any industrial or airport land uses. Um, as well as community and regional center land uses. So if you dive into uh, the city land use documents, you'll, you'll kind of see why those don't make sense, but um, they wouldn't make the best shared street, especially when, as you can see uh, with the image on the right, there are a ton of streets that uh, qualify for a community shared street so far. And then just a note, um, neighborhood bikeways, since um, the city is focusing a lot on that right now, um, those have gone through an additional layer of analysis. And if any of those were pulled out because of those three criteria before, they've been put back in. So 
moving into commercial shared streets, you'll see that this um, is narrowed down a lot more. Um, it has similar criteria to the community shared streets, except we are um, looking at some collector streets that could make good candidates for a shared street. Um, and then it's a lot more focused on the land use. So if it's a low density residential um, or if it's under 50% high density, then it would probably be a residential shared street. So it's kind of in that, it's not so much like that um, high activity commercial area that we're thinking of. Get in the chat, cool, okay. So those, those two slides were step one. Now we're moving into step two, which is prioritization. Um, and this is the step that we're currently in um, and we need your help for, as you may see the public input um, criteria right there. So we're looking at a bunch of different categories for how to prioritize the shared streets. Um, the first one is the roadway type. Um, so if it's, a, if it's a street segment or a block that is closed a lot for events, uh, it'll get a couple points. If it's uh, in, been in a lot of planning documents previously, you know, identified whether it was a shared street or a living street um, or some different names that we've given shared streets throughout the years, uh, it'll get a couple more points up. Um, if it's along a neighborhood bikeway, um, if it's close to a bid, uh, that's important for maintenance and um, those kind of things. Uh, also land use. So we're looking at, you know, if the land use that's adjacent to the street makes sense um, and how dense it is, you know, will help it be more successful because it'll be more used. Public input, which is what we need you all for. Um, Denver moves everyone. You may have seen that draft uh, just came out recently. So uh, they have a resource allocation tool that we're looking at to help bump up some of those streets as well. Um, to help reach the goals and then remove everyone. Um, as I mentioned, we want it to be connected to uh, different facilities. So transit route, bike facilities, trails um, to be tied into that multimodal network, but then also uh, connecting to parks and recreation centers as well. And then we're using the Dottie Equity Index score uh, to um, you know, weight areas that may or may not have um, more access to green space and um, other transportation elements. Okay, that was a lot, but now this is the fun part. Um, you, oops, you may have taken the locational analysis survey already, but I just wanted to show you all in case you hadn't. Um, this is what we're talking about when we say that we have public input as a prioritization metric. So you can see we have, I think over 750 um, pins on this map already because it's been open for about a month. Um, and this will be open until March 3rd, so a couple more weeks. Um, but we have some explanation about the things that we've talked about today, uh, the difference between community and commercial shared streets, um, and more about our prioritization criteria. Um, but you can see that you can drop pins in an area, like say, you think, what is this, 16th would be a good shared street. You can drop yes on that street. And then you can type a comment for why and type your email and submit it. Um, if we have something that has been pulled out, you know, for like say 17th here is not highlighted, um, that's because it didn't hit one of the criteria that we talked about before. But if you want us to consider that, like pull it back in, you can use the consider it button. Um, but if we have one highlighted that you do not think would be a good shared street, you can put the no. And then we also have an option if you have an area that you think would be a good temporary shared street. Um, you'll also notice that if you click someone else's comment, you can read it, which is cool. Um, but you can also like or dislike that comment. So if someone's already put a pin on a location that you were thinking about, uh, you can go in and agree or disagree with them there. So I will drop the link to this in the chat. Um, and we would love for you all to share this with your networks um, because we do really want to help identify, you know, the, the shared streets. You all are the boots on the ground. Like you know the areas that can be really great shared streets. So let us know. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of awesome input so far. Sharing the chat. Okay. Cool. Okay. Jumping back and then we will do the Q and A. Um, the last part is the program development. So everything we've talked about today um, is going to be part of the future Shared Streets program that will be under Dottie. Um, and to run a program well and successfully, you want to kick off with a lot of these materials that you can see on the slide here. 
So we're working on a program manual that will have, you know, a list of the policies that need to be updated. Um, it'll have that final prioritize, prioritized list of shared streets, um, implementation process, the design guidelines, um, a hiring and staffing plan, um, risk tools, evaluation, maintenance, all that kind of stuff, and the six-year funding roadmap that we also have mentioned. Oh, sorry, let me drop the other link in there. Um, Okay, that one should work. Um, and then as well, we, as you can see, have a little program brand right now. Um, and then we're working on public and developer and stakeholder fact sheets uh, that can be used as the program goes on. Uh, this is the timeline for the project. So you can see we're getting to the end. Oops. Um, Cause we're at the second community meeting here. Um, and then we'll have, we'll be finishing up the program development and the implementation plan and uh, then the program will kick off. So we are nearing the end and um, now we need your feedback. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it to Emma to do the Q&A. Sure, thank you, Rachel. So we're gonna address some of the top questions that we've gotten so far, um, and we'll see how many that we can get to at the rest of this meeting. So the first one I'm gonna bring up, I think is gonna be a question for Jay. Um, Rob is asking, six years takes us to the end of Denver's Vision Zero commitment. So with the program that's been so popular uh, with the temporary shared streets, why such a slow pace for something that can be such a great addition to our Vision Zero goals? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. Um, and I don't wanna to go too much into city processes. Um, but the way that projects work in the city is we all have to be really responsible um, with our funding because it all comes from uh, your tax dollars. And so there's an annual cycle of where we can actually ask for money. Um, and that actually corresponds to the spring. Um, so it's actually coming up here in a few uh, months. And so we ask for it. Um, there's always way more asked for than the money we have, right? Because we're all very aspirational and everyone has a lot of great project ideas. And then um, if approved, we wouldn't actually get that money until 2024. Uh, and then for a shared street specifically, um, we would need to work with the community and then physically design it. So how is it going to look in its feel, um, drainage, um, different materials, things like that. Um, and then once that design is complete, um, we would then have to go through that process again, to ask for funding to construct it. Um, so even in a perfect scenario um, where we had the ability to have uh, all the budget that we needed and there weren't any roadmaps, we still have to go through that process. And so the very earliest we could see one of these shared streets out there um, is about two years from now. Um, and it's likely that it may take even a little bit longer than that if there are any issues related to um, working with the community, if it takes a lot longer to design it, um, you know, um, if there's weather delays for construction, things like that. And so that, unfortunately, is typically why it takes a while for the city to actually build stuff because we have this built-in process to be responsible with your money. Okay, thank you. Um, Charlie, there's a couple of questions for you in regards to some of the designs, or Jay, you might be able to jump in on these as well. Um, what are these, we've looked a little bit at what the shared streets might look like, but when it comes to the actual treatments, um, is pedestrian lighting something that can be incorporated? Um, also corner bulb outs, raised crosswalks, things like that. You know, what are these shared streets really going to look like? Jay, do you want to, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, I'll let you go ahead and start. Sure. Yeah. I, I, as the design guides uh, is or design guide rather is coming together, um, we're thinking that shared trees can can take a lot of different forms. I mean, the it's fundamental level. Rachel showed a lot of the pictures of you know streets that just look very different from a typical Denver street in terms of you know what sort of paving material they have. You know, is it sort of made with a brick paver or stamped concrete or or um, some other material? Does it even have curb and gutter or not? Um, you know, there the the there are many shared streets that are curbless um, and, and in other countries, that's definitely sort of a hallmark of, of a shared street. So at least in terms of some of those big parameters, um, we're trying to leave flexibility that um, uh, a shared street could sort of take uh, a couple different forms in terms of the surface treatment, in terms of the uh, curb or curbless or structure, 
Um, a lot of that comes down to not wanting to, to make a design guide that's so expensive that they can't be built. You know, completely reconstructing a street is, is a very expensive endeavor. So um, at, at a high level, there's some big, you know, moving pieces like that. For streets that do uh, remain uh, curb streets, so streets that have curb and gutter, um, we are thinking that that sort of extensions of the curb uh, into the street, things like bulbouts, which I think the 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 uh, person asked the question mentioned, uh, are are possible. Whether those be you know corner bulbouts um, at at the uh, uh, intersections of shared streets or bulbouts uh, more uh, in the middle of the block, either to physically narrow the roadway or to uh, slow traffic by by causing some horizontal shift in the roadway. Um, we're thinking about how those could be um, uh, uh, built with more green infrastructure, with with plantings, with trees, et cetera, and how those can be done both in a permanent, you know, poured concrete versus uh, uh, an interim, you know, paint and, and delineator post sort of capacity. Um, I'll, I'll stop in a minute, but the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, we're considering a variety of what we're calling sort of amenities for, for how different people using uh, the shared street um, uh, might um you know, do more than just either move or stop and hang out. What other things might people want to do in a shared street? So an easy example just to think of is, you know, can we, um, by by widening the curb uh, in certain places, does that give us a place for, for places to gather or seating or stuff like that? Um, and of course, landscaping, lighting and the like are, are all, you know, important elements that would go along with those sorts of amenities. So in it, its current um, direction, the design guide list is fairly uh, broad and ambitious in terms of what it can enable. Obviously the devil is in the details of, of you know, what, what we can do from a funding standpoint as, as Jay indicated previously. Great, thank you. Um, so Rachel, a question for you in regards to that um, initial survey that we done about the temporary shared streets. Can you share some of the things that people really liked about those temporary shared streets um, that we found from that survey? Oh, good question. Um, Jay, if you want to jump in on this too. Um, mostly, I would say people like to have safe spaces to walk and bike um, and also have uh, spaces to spread out during the pandemic. Um, I know some anecdotal things I remember seeing were like, if people were walking their dogs, you know, sometimes dogs sniff and fight and stuff like that, but you had a lot more space just to spread out, um, which was useful for a lot of different reasons. So having more space to, yeah, walk and bike safely. Jay, if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, totally that. Probably a lot of the reasons why you all, um, or most of you enjoyed them, you know, really was just having more space um, dedicated to being comfortable as you kind of recreate, sit and chat with, you know, your neighbors, or you're just trying to get to your job or, you know, the grocery store or what have you. Um, really, when you're looking at a street, um, the right of way is classified as private property line to the private property lines. And so sometimes it's like business to business or house to house. And you typically will have like a five foot sidewalk, maybe a 40 foot uh, road and then another five foot sidewalk. Um, and so there's very little actual room for people walking. Um, we've gotten a little bit better as far as getting room for people biking, but um, predominantly the amount of space is dedicated to vehicles. And you can see that by 40% of the real estate in the county of Denver being dedicated to the right of way, most of that being to the car, which is a massive amount. Um, and so I think people really just felt like, you know, actually having space to be out of the car and do other things in the road um, was nice, frankly. Definitely. Okay, another question for you, Jay. You've sort of touched on this already. Um, but we have some people asking about in the two to five, however many years um, until this program materializes, if there's any opportunity for temporary measures, um, either on any of the identified streets now or the previous temporary shared streets to continue. Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, before the pandemic and us experimenting with shared streets and, and outdoor dining, I would have said no. Um, when you are talking about vehicles and the right of way in general, the city as a whole is very risk adverse. Um, you know, I've seen some comments about Vision Zero. We have a lot of traffic fatalities right now and injuries. Um, sometimes that's because of engineering, sometimes that's because people are speeding or inebriated. Um, but typically, anything that you put in the street at some point will get hit. Um, and so it might be okay for a year, but eventually, um, it will get hit, and maybe that thing is a person. 
And so when we're talking about experimenting in the road with temporary things, very hard to do that because to do something temporary that is also safe, um, there isn't a lot of overlap between those two things. And I think there is some appetite to do that now. Um, we're working internally to try to figure that out because we don't want to wait, you know, a number of years before we can create some of these. We understand that. Um, but it's just finding that tricky balance between temporary and maintaining that safety and where that line is. And so um, as part of this, we're trying to figure that out as well. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. You did mention um, outdoor dining in that answer, Jay, and we had a couple questions about the outdoor places program. So maybe you can touch on how those programs might coordinate and potentially reinforce each other. Uh, yes, um, they actually are coordinating uh, beautifully. Um, I'm actually the project manager on that program as well. And then all of the fine consultants you see here are also working on that program. Uh, and so this is a perfect example of not having two different silo projects. Uh, tons of brain power going back and forth between those two. I will say, though, that while both of them are allowing us to rethink the right of way into more people first spaces, um, they are fairly different as far as having dedicated spaces for outdoor dining. We're not mixing tables and chairs where people are supposed to walk, for example. So we'll still have you know, dedicated space for people to walk. So it's um, accessible. It's easy for people with um, physical disabilities and young and old, um, or as a shared street, it's kind of, we really do want a lot of that to mix together. Um, but they're definitely, all, I think, is overlap related to some of the full street closures. Um, for example, we're working with a few of them to kind of figure out what that would look like in the future, where maybe it's a, a shared um, aspect for pedestrians and bicycle, bicyclists to move kind of through a block. Um, but those, um, all of those blocks would be closed from cars. So it's not a true shared street, but it's kind of shared as far as bikes and pets go. So a lot of overlap there, a lot of people are working on them, but they are fairly distinct in kind of how the look and feel ultimately from a technical standpoint. Okay, great. Um, Rachel, you might be able to answer this one and Jay as well again. Um, so Jane is, is letting us know that Dendrites clearly want these shared streets. Um, like we learned from our survey, they're very popular. They were used a lot. They enhance safety and all the other benefits that we've discussed. So what can residents and community members do to support this project um, to expand, improve, and fast track this program? Yeah, um, I would say number one right now is share the survey. Um, neighbors, you know, social media, uh, share the survey, see where people um, think would be great locations for shared streets. Um, and then I would say when we start to build them, help people change the way that they think about the right of way. Um, also ROW, I saw a couple questions. Um, ROW is the right of way. So that's like the building to building space. Yeah, great answer, Rachel. And, and just to kind of add to that, um, just being fully transparent, a lot of this is gonna come down to budget. Um, we talked about that a little bit already. Denver has grown a lot and has a lot of needs. We need budget to go um, to, you know, people experiencing homelessness, you know, um, public safety, paving our roads, uh, affordable housing. There's only really so many ways to split the pie. Certainly, this is uh, something that's important, um, but really the folks that decide on where that money goes are oftentimes your elected officials. Uh, and so we actually do have um, a mayor's race, city council race with many districts open right now. So if you're truly passionate about this and, and want to set us up for success and, and give the city the budget and the tools it needs to actually implement these um, at a larger scale, I would talk to your elected officials that are either in place now or are running uh, and make sure that this is a priority for them because then that will come back to us uh, in giving us resources to actually capitalize how we would like to do this. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so Lisa's asking about why just one to three block segments. Um, so Charlie, you and Jay can tackle this one. Um, she's wondering if there are really benefits to the community and users if it's such a small segment, um, especially because the temporary shared streets during the pandemic seem to typically be several blocks long. Yeah, I'll jump first in this one, Charlie. Um, yeah, the temporary ones, they, they were certainly longer, um, but they were much more simplistic in their design. 
Um, and they were very bare bones because again, um, they were kind of meant to be quick and dirty for lack of a better term and temporary. When we're talking about a shared street that's gonna be permanent, we're talking about something that can and, and likely will be very expensive. Um, and it really depends on the level that we have. Um, for folks that maybe aren't aware, um, the 39th Avenue Greenway is actually the first shared street that Denver has um, that is really done um, at a very high level. Um, so it's completely curbless. You know, as a pedestrian or bicyclist, you can kind of step uh, from the street to the sidewalk at any point. There's some really nice high quality green infrastructure. You know, it was uh, constructed in a very sustainable manner. It's used with um, brick pavers that give kind of that tactile feel. Um, to cars that they absolutely need to slow down. It's not a place that they can speed. We have high quality benches, landscaping. Um, you know, it's next to kind of a nice trail network. There's art. All of that is is awesome and great, um, but it can be can be and is very, very expensive to do that. Uh, and so we kind of have to balance ultimately how much money we have and how much impact we can do. And so the idea is that at least initially we'll start building shared streets in kind of a one to three block fashion that will be connected to the larger multimodal um, opportunity. So maybe you'll have to take a nice sidewalk or a bike lane to get there, and then you'll have the ability to have that shared street and can, can continue on in your way in another fashion. Uh, but that's kind of how we have to start to make sure we can get these in as many places as possible in Denver. Um, but that's not to say that if it's really successful, that we can actually grow from there. We can continue to make them longer, and eventually it could you know, become in some sort of urban trail network almost, you know, kind of um, what many parts of the 5280 trail is kind of envisioning. And so um, kind of start small, do it right, and grow from there. Great, great answer. And um, there, I'm seeing a, some concerns about the um, taking out of signalized intersections from our locational analysis. And I think that kind of relates to that start small mentality that you just described, but I just wondered if you wanted to expand on that at all. Yeah, I'll hand that one over to Charlie, Get a little bit more technical on that one. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think, Emma, you make a good point about, you know, starting small and, and that you know, shared trees that connect at signalized intersections might not be the place to do that. Um, overall, uh, some of the challenges that, that we're just thinking about as it relates to signals is that usually signals are located at, at a specific point because you have a high volume of traffic trying to enter another street, right? So uh, in all likelihood, um, the, the idea of, of managing traffic volume uh, that high down to a level that would be acceptable for a shared street could cause um, spillover onto adjacent streets that you know is overall undesirable from a neighborhood standpoint. Um, there's also um, some issues just related to um, the way that vehicle code works and how two drivers approaching from opposite directions are you know looking at a signal, knowing that they're they're going to have um, you know need to make their turn movements. Maybe they're looking at a at a at a um, uh, a green ball and making a turn. Um, if they're entering a shared space, are they necessarily going to have the space to actually turn into the street um, or not? That space needs to be clear for them. Um, are they potentially running the risk of, of setting people up for, for traffic crashes at the gateways? That's something that, that we're uh, frankly concerned about. So um, it's not to say that eventually maybe that, that doesn't become a possibility, but in the near term, particularly if we're you know targeting uh, streets where we can achieve a, a certain um, volume and speed profile that's really low, um, intersections of traffic signals uh, themselves just aren't particularly suitable. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I'm going to jump to a bit of a, another kind of design question, but a little bit different. So Lisa is wondering if neighborhood organizations will be included in the decisions around the design. So um, since they differ from location to location, when these are actually implemented um, in specific locations, who is kind of going to be included in that design process? Yeah, that is uh, such an important question. And so just to take a moment to clarify, you know, the what we're trying to do right now is ask you kind of in a perfect world, where would you like to see some of these? And then we'll kind of put it uh, with our other uh, prioritization metrics there. And we'll actually spit out a list from, you know, one to 500. The idea then is we take maybe the first top 10 of them 
and then actually go to the community and um, reconfirm and have those conversations to say, hey, specifically you um, that live here, do you actually want this? And if it's a yes, so we confirm, you know, ultimately, you know, what we got online through this process, we will then um, come back periodically. Typically what the city does is um, we collect initial feedback. Um, what do you want this to kind of look and feel like? What are the important considerations? You know, how do people drive through here? Where do they walk? You know, does it connect to a park? You know, all the details that those neighbors know way better than we do um, at a citywide level. And then we'll go ahead and incorporate that into a design. And then we come back and say, hey, here's, here's what we built based on what we heard. You know, what do you like? What do you don't like? What things should we maybe change? Um, and then sometimes we'll come back even a second time and then it would get constructed. And so nothing that's identified here is gonna go immediately into the hopper to be constructed. It's just which one should we start talking with the community first and then head into design if it's approved. Okay, great, thanks. Um, this is kind of an interesting question. I like this one. Um, for people who are highly supportive of more opportunities for moving and accommodating people outside of just vehicles, um, what kind of negative feedback have we received on this project that we can speak to to help um, others advocate and kind of speak against those negative um, that negative feedback that that we may have received? Yeah, Rachel, I'm wondering if maybe, you know, you having gone through some of the comments uh, with the surveys, if there are any that stuck out to you, and I'm happy to add to that as well. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've we received a lot of survey responses, and so far they've been overwhelmingly positive. So um, I think, obviously, listening to people that have complaints because they're coming from somewhere um, and figuring out how we can incorporate those to make better shared streets. Um, I think part of the question was like how to respond to those. Um, I mean, the city's priorities are for people walking and biking and we are going to prioritize those. So that would be my response to that. Yeah, um, in addition to that, some of the other things were, um, you know, the, the temporary shared streets, maybe they experience those and assume the city is gonna build something like that. Those were uh, unsightly and ugly and all of those things that um, we just kind of dealt with. You do it temporarily and quickly. That is not at all what a permanent shared street would look like. You can reference some of the images here. You can reference 39th Avenue Greenway um, or, or potentially even some of the bike infrastructure that's going in for some of those elements. Um, so it's going to look much, much nicer. Um, we're also not putting these everywhere like we've talked about due to budget issues and other things. Um, there are still a lot of people in Denver that rely on their vehicle and need to get around with the vehicle. Um, and so we are going to have streets where they are going to cater more to vehicles. Um, and then especially even with shared streets, um, the, the, the small amount that we have relative to all of the streets in Denver, um, vehicles will still be allowed because these will likely still be um, in front of people's homes or in commercial areas where you know, they still need to have like delivery trucks and stuff like that. Um, and so um, vehicles will still be allowed. It really is just prioritizing pedestrians and bicyclists as opposed to traditionally on, on a lot of these streets, it's prioritizing the vehicles. Um, so the idea really is we have a lot of those streets already. Let's have a small amount uh, and kind of flip the thought process for those. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to get a little more technical again. Um, is there a plan for snow, remo snow removal and then other, I've seen a few questions, other maintenance access issues, things like that? How are we addressing those? Yeah, uh, very, very good questions and things that we're actively working on that kind of fits under like the program development bucket where it's a lot of those internal city conversations on how we deal with these. Um, so right now, you know, we're trying to figure out what do we do with snow on a shared street? Because we're inviting pedestrians to be in, in the streets, um, whereas right now they're, they're really restricted to the sidewalks. And so we will likely need to add those as priority streets to be plowed, um, as opposed to maybe right now, a specific street in the neighborhood doesn't get plowed or only gets plowed when there's a lot of snow. We'll have to, we'll have to actually make that a priority route because it would be a shared street. Um, but of course, that takes um, resources and funding and all of that. So that kind of adds uh, the complexity to that. And then maintenance is, is also a big one. Um, and so, 
you know, what we heard from a lot of you is that to build a shared street, um, we want it to feel nice. You know, we want there to be trees, landscaping, green infrastructure, pedestrian lighting, um, maybe community gardens and some of the space could even be recreational equipment, murals, stuff like that, that make it feel more than just, you know, a, a street. Um, but all of those things take maintenance. Uh, and so that's where we would work with, uh, say, like a business improvement district or a maintenance district in like a commercial area where we would build it, but then they would take care of like the day-to-day -day operations of snow, ice, watering, trash, things like that. Um, but for some of the ones in like a residential neighborhood, we really don't have those organizations to rely on. So then that's where the city would have to find resources uh, to take the lead there or potentially work with like say a uh, registered neighborhood organization um, or maybe some public champions in that area that can help us out. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see. There's a few questions about enforcement of shared streets, which I think ties in a little bit to that maintenance discussion. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so I'm guessing what that means is that um, during kind of the temporary shared streets, you know, there were maybe still folks that thought that they could drive down them or could drive down them very fast despite our temporary efforts. Um, so, you know, uh, again, one of the reasons why we want to go a little bit slower and be thoughtful around the design is that we actually want to make these streets people physically have to slow down or physically have to go a different route um, and not necessarily be for cut through for traffic. So that is kind of some of the technical stuff we talked about with the bump outs and the neck downs, you know, rip, maybe it's a raised intersection, um, maybe it's curbless with um, pavers or um, uh, other elements that physically kind of tell the driver they have to slow down. I think we all know that you can't just put a sign up um, and assume people will read it and, and behave nicely. So we have to design it in a way that physically does make vehicles slow down. So um, it is safer to be in them. Whereas the temporary ones, because like I said, they would kind of move, you know, the wind or otherwise, we couldn't be out there 24 seven. It was really hard um, to always have those in place to physically force people to slow down. And so that's that's maybe where you saw some enforcement areas. All right. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions about potentially involving neighborhood organizations or local artists um, to sort of adopt shared streets or make them a little bit nicer than what the city may be able to fund. So is there any coordination in that regard um, or opportunities for community members to contribute? Yeah, totally. Um, when we get through this process and, and we identify some of those top locations, we reach out to the community and we have funding attached. So we're at that point where we can construct something. Um, that's when we would want to work with the community to figure out ultimately, you know, um, who could take care of this? You know, can we add a mural to it? Are any artists interested? Things like that. Um, so it's, it's still early. I appreciate the comments. Um, but if they do happen in your neighborhood or you kind of hear them happening uh, in the coming years, please participate because we would all love your uh, ability to make them nicer than the, the city can do on its own. Great. Um, so I'm seeing a, a lot of comments, um, sort of comment questions about so going back to our, our funding and temporary shared street discussion. Um, if there's a way to include a greater quantity of some of those more bare bones shared streets, um, if we can increase linear connectivity that way, um, rather than planning for them to be high cost from the start and instead sort of iteratively refine them with low costs leading to, you know, revised to a final implementation to sort of give people those shared streets right from the get go. Is there any path forward to that that you see? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's something that that we're actively considering. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of a decision. I think it's going to depend on the community as well um, and what the community character is and ultimately what that specific community would desire. Um, I think a, a good way to look at it is maybe what Denver has done with um, some of their bike lanes and bike infrastructure in general. You know, um, 10, 20 years ago, it kind of started with a, a single painted line on the ground, like let's just put something out there, right? Um, and now we've gotten much more sophisticated 
um, with building actually permanent, you know, concrete, um, you know, Brighton Boulevard. It's like a separate elevated um, bike lane related to that. We have a great trail network and all of that. So definitely, I think there is the ability to start at more low cost. Um, but we also want to make sure because that we actually kind of, you know, thread that needle correctly, because one of the biggest concerns we hear about bike infrastructure is that it's just ugly or it's just not very nice and act, people actually want it to be really nice. Um, and so it is kind of blending, um, doing low cost and doing it in more locations or making it um, fairly nice. That's that's going to be great from the start. And I think a lot of that just depends on conversations with the community and what they want. All right, definitely. Um, when we're thinking about coordinating with some other city initiatives, uh, there's a couple of questions about kind of two different parts, but um, the new law making it legal to walk in the streets in Denver, and then also thinking about the recently passed Denver Deserve Sidewalks, if either of those are going to interact at all with our planning process here. Uh, yeah, interesting question. I, I think I think so. Um, to address the, the jaywalking bill, um, it's not legal to just kind of hang out in a street, but it is legal for you to safely when there's not any conflicts to cross wherever. Um, so it's a little bit different than just kind of hanging out in the streets. So I wanted to, to, to make that clear there. Um, and then the sidewalk bill um, really just shifts uh, the responsibility of the homeowner or the property owner to maintain and construct their sidewalk to then paying a tax for the city to do that. Uh, and so I think, you know, in both cases, both of those are really focused on the pedestrian. Uh, and having a better experience, which is fantastic um, and is something that's important here. So, you know, a good example is where we would build a shared street. We would want to coordinate with that sidewalk team to make sure that um, we do have really good sidewalks leading to that. Because again, you know, they're going to start to be one to three blocks. Um, people will need to walk there if they do want to experience them. So we need to make sure, um, you know, number one, there is a sidewalk and number two, it's of good quality and ADA accessible and and things like that. Great. Um, let's see, still kind of on that train of connecting to other initiatives. Um, are the shared streets going to um, be incorporated into safe routes to school planning? Or also, are we coordinating with any other um, Denver, what's the word I'm looking for, groups like the like public health or anything like that? Uh, yeah, totally. Um, so as part of our prioritization effort, we're actually bringing in uh, planning efforts that have happened in the past. Um, even though, you know, we, we kind of experimented with shared streets recently, there are a handful of already adopted community plans that call for shared streets. Um, so that's a, a good way for, for some of those previous efforts and ongoing efforts to get plugged into this. And for things like uh, safe routes to school, so for the Folks that maybe aren't familiar with that, um, the city does have a dedicated individual that's working to make it easier for um, you know school children to actually walk or bike to school as opposed to just relying on uh, maybe a bus or for their parents uh, to drive them. And so certainly uh, we would want to overlap with them. I think it gets a little tricky when building shared streets around schools. I think it it makes a lot of sense, um, but at the same time. Denver with open enrollment, you know, schools are, are often pretty chaotic, with a lot of cars in the area. Uh, and so uh, I think there are opportunities to do better there and to coordinate, um, but it does just kind of get tricky depending on the school. Thanks. Um, maybe we can address, there's a few questions about biking. Um, since we know the temporary shared streets were so effective at encouraging people to walk and bike, are these shared streets going to connect to some of the major biking and walking through, through thoroughfares, um, like the Cherry Creek Trail? And then uh, there was another similar question. Um, can shared streets be used to help create specific bike priority corridors? Yeah, totally. Um, a big part of our prioritization is how, how does it connect uh, to transit, to biking, to walking infrastructure. Um, and so I think maybe uh, an ideal example is um, you've got maybe a neighborhood bikeway. So it's, it's a really safe, high, comfortable facility for people to bike on that then leads to a trail or a park or something like that. And maybe along that route for a couple blocks, it's a shared street where it makes sense. Um, so it's easy to 
walk and bike to there. Uh, of course, when you are there and then leaving from there, but then it also, um, if you don't want to necessarily hang out in that place um, and, and just kind of experience it as a, a shared street in that neighborhood, it still acts as a super safe connection to actually get you through there to, you know, wherever you may be going and whatever route you may be taking. Great. Um, let's see, let's touch on this question. So what does, do we know, or what does current design, current transportation design research suggest, like any sort of best practices in mixing transportation modes? And then have any of those best practices been identified in other cities that we've looked at? You wanna leave that one, Charlie, and then I'll jump in. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think, general practices for shared streets it really internationally um, relate a lot to giving very very strong visual cues so that's why in a lot of the pictures that, that Rachel showed in the presentation you know the the paving material is different the curb is is gone from the street um, and it almost looks as though the street is really just sort of an extension of the buildings you know sort of in, in the middle. Um, so it gives that really strong visual cue to people driving that, hey, this is a different space. Um, a lot of those examples, or most of them, also are very light on signage, um, and, and that's really an international um, best practice in this case, where um, the more that you delineate, the more that you um, sign, the more that it makes people feel as though they um, uh, uh, sort of maybe have like an entitlement to this space that they're in. So there is some research that shows when you add a center line to a street, people go faster because they feel like they're, you know, in control of their lane, right? So uh, shared street best practice is basically the complete opposite of that, that in absence of markings and absence of signage uh, and, and with strong visual cues, uh, people uh, slow down, raise their state of awareness. And that's really sort of behaviorally what we're looking for in this space. That said, you know, we are trying to make sure that we're doing that in a way that, that makes it geometrically just very, very difficult to achieve any rate of speed um, where uh, it would, you know, uh, pose a risk to someone walking or biking. So, you know, the combination of all those effects together and done right and, and done at the right chosen locations, you know, hopefully the only people driving down these streets you know, aren't really trying to get, uh, you know, anywhere through, uh, uh, you know, trying to use that as a through street, uh, you know, hopefully they're only using it for, for local access, but also their expectation is they're not trying to get anywhere quickly on that street um, at all. So those are, are a lot of the best practices and, and definitely things that, that we're thinking about um, uh, as we're doing the design guidelines, um, part based on international best practice, but also do have, you um, uh, 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 conversations even tomorrow with other, you know, American cities that are doing shared streets. So um, definitely trying to learn from our peers here uh, in the U.S. Yeah, and I think I think just to add to that, um, you know, there there is a, a fair amount of body of research, but it is also kind of a, a new and evolving space as well, based on what a lot of cities experimented with shared streets and how many of them are, are trying to figure out what we are and how do we make them permanent. I think, again, maybe to make the correlation to um, biking, for example, you know, uh, many cities, maybe Denver was one of them um, you know, a couple of decades ago, they, you would have thought it was crazy to have a bike mixing with a car on the street and how unsafe that would be. And you should bike only on the sidewalk, for example. Um, but what we understand now is, you know, when you have access for people to bike, um, it actually makes the, the, the street itself safer. It slows cars down and makes people look um, and be more aware, you, you know, during times of traffic, you can actually get more people to draw, um, actually go through the street on a bike, because of course, one person on a bike versus one person in a car, it's a much more efficient use of space. And then there's actually been a lot of economic analysis that shows when you add bike lanes to uh, commercial areas that um, people actually spend more money at those businesses, because they're not just speeding through and not seeing any of these businesses. You know, they may stop because they see something at a coffee shop or catch a donut or whatever. Um, so we didn't know a lot of that a couple of decades ago. And we, we were starting to learn that the, you know, the last probably 10 or so years. And I think a lot of that is going to um, come to light, too, as well, about shared streets and more um, people for spaces as we learn nationally and internationally kind of how important these are for, for select streets within our cities. Great answer. Thank you. Um, two kind of questions about the future when 
these are eventually implemented. Um, one is how will people who didn't know before find out about the changes and, and provide their input um, in a non-disruptive way when it is implemented? And then also once they're built, will there be dedicated funding for maintenance for a certain number of years um, in residential areas? Um, yeah, so as far as how you would be aware, so traditionally the way that um, the city will alert folks about projects are through your city councilor. So sometimes they'll have uh, newsletters or town halls, we're at the town hall right now, um, or through like a resident neighborhood organization. Um, and so it's always good to maybe sign up for some of those kind of small you know, type of government in your neighborhood and, and just kind of passively you know, put extra emails and newsletters and things like that. Um, and so that's often the, the ability for us to do that. We also post things on social media um, before we would construct anything, you know, we would send out um, flyers, you know, to where you live and, and where you work. Um, so there's a variety of ways that we try to connect with you. It doesn't always, it's not always effective. If people are busy, they don't always pay attention to that stuff or they don't have the time. So it's not perfect. Um, so it does rely kind of on you to be somewhat plugged into to some of that if you have, or at least want to get into it at an early level so you can have your voice heard and, and can influence some of the design. Um, okay, great. Um, let's see. I have a couple of questions about equity. Um, one specific one is how we're considering neighborhoods that have a greater density of economically disadvantaged people um, or people who need to drive because they don't have other choices where they work um, or because they are not able to access the public transportation system. Yeah, gosh, such a, a good question and, and was a really important learning lesson for our temporary shared streets. Uh, a really good example is um, one of the 11 locations that we initially selected and implemented was Bowling Street up in Montbello. Um, you know, originally we thought that, you know, this is a disadvantaged community, traditionally has not gotten a lot of resources from the city. We want to make sure that they can participate in this opportunity. Um, but what we found um, are, are a couple of things. You know, number one, that community relies more so on their vehicles uh, or public transit. And so, um, you know, they really did not desire to have a street that restricted them in that standpoint. And then also, secondly, um, you know, due to a variety of things about how um, good or bad we could communicate during the pandemic, um, a lot of those folks just kind of thought they would be, it was under construction because it looked like construction barricades, right? Um, and they're not used to actually getting attention on something special like this from the city. Um, so they actually didn't even know it was for them. Um, and so I think that's another example of, of even if we do select a street and maybe some of those areas and, and they do decide that they do want something like this, uh, despite maybe having to rely on their automobile more, um, that we don't stop after it's constructed, um, that we invite people to use it. We continually let them know it, what it is and how it's for them and how it benefits their community. And then they can go ahead and spread that word. Yeah, just to add to that, um, I mentioned this at the beginning, but a couple of our team members are at the District 11 Town Hall too, so continuing those conversations. Um, and we do have um, some representatives from that area on our stakeholder working group. All right, definitely. Um, so there's a bit of a discussion going on about the downtown area. Um, the specific question is if we've had any uh, discussion about closing any of the streets to vehicle traffic, which is not the purpose of this project, but maybe we can talk about whether shared streets will have any impact on downtown. Um, my kind of connection broke a little bit about that. Are you just saying, are there maybe any streets downtown where, where the city has talked about physically closing them from cars? That was the original question, and then knowing that this program is not actually addressing closing streets entirely, um, is our shared streets going to be seen in downtown? Or are they going to affect downtown at all? Yeah, that's a, a, an interesting question. I think downtown um, is about as complex of an environment as you can and take care of. Um, tons of people commuting in, uh, lots of deliveries. Um, you've got scooters. You've got um, Lyft and Uber, you've got late night, you've got commuter rush hour, um, you know, you've got a variety of things intermixed there. And so the, the highest demand out of our streets are in our downtowns. 
Um, I do think there is maybe some vague language about ingestion pricing and things like that far into the future in Denver Moves Everyone that just recently completed. So uh, potentially at some point, the city may consider um, physically closing maybe some select streets to cars where it makes sense. But I think that's a really long way away. And, and there will be many, many conversations about that ahead of time. Um, but I think maybe some of the more realistic things you could see in the future is um, where outdoor places, um, specifically Larimer Square and Glen Arm, those are likely two street closures that will continue into the future. Um, and while none of them will actually have vehicle traffic on them, so kind of, you know, while you're taking a closed street, they do need to both accommodate people biking and walking through that area. So there will be accommodations for those in addition to to the outdoor dining. And so that's, uh, those are probably a couple of realistic examples of closed streets in Denver that you will be able to experience downtown um, in the years to come. All right, great. Um, we've got two kind of more design focused questions um, back to snow. So <laughs> one of which that I just lost on my screen, but, um, Essentially, are there are there other things we can do to make shared streets more comfortable in the winter beyond plowing? Um, and then kind of along that line, there was a question about curbless streets and how those will be, how those will interact with um, climate events like flash floods and increased snowfall plowing, things like that. Let me take those, Jay. Yeah, at least that first one. Yeah. Okay, first one. Uh, yeah, but you can't do two at once on me. Sorry. Can you <laughs> do the first one again? No, you're good. Yeah, it's just a question about whether there are any other steps we can take to make sure it's yeah. just more comfortable in the winter um, with the plowing issues. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, state the obvious that um, uh, you know shading uh, and shaded areas you know make the snow stick around longer, right? So um, one thing to that we might be considering as we're getting towards implementation is where do we arrange uh, certain amenities within a street and do we try to arrange them on the side that's going to get more sun in the winter time those are you know very inexpensive tactical strategies to try to make them more comfortable um, and, and you know hopefully we can do that in a way that they get some good shade in the summer so that people aren't just getting scorched um, once once the the uh, temperatures do rise so you know there there are um, low cost things like that um, as well as and I don't think we're uh, talking about it or at least not seriously as a part of this just given the cost but you know there there are ways of um, radiantly heating streets um, that you see in like ski towns and some ski villages and and on college campuses. Um, huge um, construction costs, huge maintenance costs here. So really trying to think if how do we do it in a way that uh, is smart in design that you know makes it comfortable, gets rid of the snow uh, cheaply and quickly if possible, uh, while um, frankly minimizing what we call handwork, which is you know clearing show snow with hand and shovel rather than relying on vehicles to do that. So um, it is complex, um, that's for sure. Um, second question. Uh see if I can find it again. I believe it had to do with the curbless street design. Oh, curbless. And, yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, independent of whether there is a curb or not a curb, um, what engineers are typically looking at when we're designing uh, uh, streets for stormwater is um, the, uh, the intensity of storms, the volume of water that can fall over a certain amount of time, and whether or not a street has the capacity to physically hold that water in it um, when the uh, underground storm drainage system can't clear it quickly enough. So I'm not a drainage engineer, I shouldn't pretend to be, um, but those are at a high level, the variables that the engineers are looking at. So you can imagine, you know, the, the way that a, a street is with curves, it sort of creates sort of like a bowl um, with vertical sides on it to store water if it needs to. Um, a shared street typically will drain more towards the middle. So rather than, you know, a bowl with a flat bottom and two sides on it, imagine it like a sort of a V shape. And, and that can still store a lot of the, the same volume as um, a street uh, with, with a curb. So obviously the, the devil's in the details of all of that, but definitely trying to, or definitely need to make sure when we're doing uh, uh, shared street designs that are curbless, that we're doing that in such a way that we're not increasing flood risk uh, to adjacent properties. Yeah, and then just kind of add, to add on to that, 
different than the question, but an important thing to consider. It's really technical, but we have a, a really technical and smart group here is that um, what Charlie was talking about, uh, most if not all of our roads have a, what we call a crown on them. So they're actually, um, it's kind of bowl shaped. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's very prominent. And the idea is that the rain falls and then immediately goes through the curves. Um, that's great for rain, um, especially as we have more unpredictable weather events uh, with climate change. The issue is that um, many of those streets are not ADA accessible. Um, there's a certain angle where uh, federally um, you have to, to mandate to allow people to be in the street like a shared street. And so depending on that, that curve of the street, I, I you know, challenge all of you to go out there and take a look at some of them next time you're walking. Um, it could be quite expensive. We could have to completely tear out that entire street and redo it. And that again is you know what we talk about with costs and and where we may be able to do these versus where we where we can't do them just because costs may be too high. Great answer. Thanks, guys. I think we can squeeze in one or two more questions before we're out of time. Um, so there's been a little bit of discussion about some more innovative ways to potentially provide funding. One in particular that came up is if there is a way to have larger new construction contribute towards future shared street streetscapes kind of along with their projects. Um, so that's asking when we're already going to go in and kind of redo the street is that at that time we consider a shared street. I think that's a really good idea, right? So um, you know, economies of scale, we're already going to be doing stuff there. Let's add this on to it. Um, the problem is we don't really do that a ton in Denver. Um, certainly there's new neighborhoods that are be building um, in and around Denver. You know, um, we're going to be redeveloping um, some of the parking lots in Mile High, um, some other locations like that where they're essentially brand new neighborhoods. We are going to be aggressively working with developers because that's kind of the perfect time to say, hey, this would be a great place for shared street. But when we're talking about retrofitting streets, I mean, just think of maybe the last time your street even got um, paved, much less like completely taken out and put back in. It just doesn't happen a lot. So yes, um, we will absolutely do that. Um, we regularly do that. It's called a one build strategy. We have at Dottie. So um, making sure we do as many things all at once for economies of scale and to impact people less. Um, but the opportunities to do that may, may not be as many as we would like. All right, definitely. Uh, all right, one more last kind of broad question, then we're going to wrap it up. Um, there's been some comments about why we can't consider all neighborhood streets as shared streets where pedestrians have equal, equal access. Um, rather than calling a handful of block sec sections shared, kind of implying that the rest of our streets are not intended to be shared. So maybe we can just touch really quickly on that sort of distinction and, and what we're trying to do here, and then we can wrap up. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting question. I think um, maybe in the future we can get there, um, but right now uh, a vast majority of folks either getting to work or just kind of uh, running errands actually do rely on their vehicle. And so you do kind of get a little bit into the chicken and egg on, on why they do that. Um, but you're also getting into zoning where people are, are forced to live versus where they have to work um, and things like that. And so right now it's just not feasible to prioritize every single street to be for pedestrians. I think we absolutely need select streets to do that. And we need some streets, say like a a Colfax, uh, you know, a Lincoln, Broadway, things like that to primarily be for cars. Um, and it's just kind of finding that balance of which streets should be what. And then maybe in the future when we have a completely different Denver um, and more people are able to walk to work and grocery stores and all of that, that we could consider having even more of those pedestrian focused streets. All right, great. Well, thank you guys all so much for those questions. Great, thank you. Um, we were trying to answer as many questions um, in the in the chat, like in the question function as we could as well to knock some of these out, but um, just know that we are reading them and we will take these questions back and add them to the FAQ on the website. So if we didn't have time for your question, um, we're seeing it and we will uh, answer it. So thank you all so much. We appreciate you taking time out of your evening to listen to this. Yeah, absolutely. And just echo that. Really great comments, really great feedback. Really uh, appreciate the participation. Um, we'll probably finish this program here in the coming months. Uh, stay tuned for kind of newsletters, social media, things like that. 
And then um, we will really rely on you to work with your elected officials and continue to advocate for these, um, which will then in turn allow us to build more of them. So, um, you know, you're, uh, you're, you'll get homework on top of homework, unfortunately, um, but, you know, we're hoping that you can help support us in this effort. Great. Thank you so all. Everyone, have a good night.